Welcome to the latest episode of The School Report, the series where we shine a spotlight on the things that matter most to our parents and families. In our first episode, we spoke about all things kindergarten. And in our second episode, we lifted the lid on the transformation of sport across Sydney Catholic schools. Today, we shift our focus to protecting students online. We'll look at how parents can help their children safely navigate the online world, what parents need to be mindful of when it comes to social media, and provide some tips on how we can all promote healthy digital habits in the home. To help us dive into this wide-reaching topic, we first have the pleasure of being joined by Australian Federal Police Detective, Superintendent Stephen Jay. Stephen has enjoyed a 30-year career with the AFP, working across Australia, the UK and Asia Pacific, and is now attached to the Australian Centre to Counter Child Exploitation. Stephen, thank you for joining us on The School Report. Oh, my pleasure, thank you. Thank it's you wonderful to have you. Sure. Stephen, protecting our children is the highest priority for parents. Mm. How are the <clears throat> AFP helping parents and communities protect children? Yeah, unfortunately, the reality is these days, um, what we are seeing around the world and across Australia as well is a steep rise in the number of issues of online child sexual exploitation, grooming and sextortion. So one part of the answer is to investigate and prosecute people who commit these offences and identify and rescue children from harm. The second part is obviously to, to work with kids and parents to, to make them safe online. One of the areas I do manage, which I'm very proud of, is the um, online child safety team, which manage the AFP's Think You Know program. The Think You Know program, um, the website's quite instructive, provides great information around how kids should be, um, how they can stay safe online and provides a means through which uh, presentations can be delivered to children, um, to parents and to teachers, providing up-to-date information around the threats that exist online and also the way to, to remediate those. The good thing about the Think You Know program is it's graduated for different age groups. It matches the, um, the school curriculum, so all the way from early childhood all the way through to senior high school. So there is a continual program that goes all the way through. The other really good thing about the Think You Know program is it's not set and forget, it's updated with the latest intelligence. So the Think You Know team speak to our intelligence team. So as new information comes around a particular issue we're seeing online, that's fed into the presentations we deliver. So the Think You Know program and the presentations we deliver provide a really good start together with the website for tools for children to stay safe online. And really matches that technology that's in, in, the, in the environment. Absolutely. And the program is delivered by police. It's also delivered by volunteers from across the community. So it is for kids. So we do go to, to schools and I would encourage if there is interest around presentations um, to go to the website to book a presentation and we can provide that at school. But we also present to community groups and to parents. So parents have information around what the threats look like online and how to have conversations with children about how to be safe. That's such a great point because parents are really essential in this. What can <clears throat> parents and carers do? I completely agree. I think uh, parents play a really important role about keeping kids safe online. Unfortunately, what we've heard is um, only 50% of parents actually speak to, to their children about half. Being, being safe. Yeah, half parents talk about what it's like to be safe online. And um, of those, only two or three percent actually talk around things like online grooming and sextortion, which are rising issues. So that that troubles us somewhat. It's very important that parents lead these discussions mm. and create an environment um, at the home where you can talk about these issues to to help kids have a conversation around what they need to do to stay safe. Stephen, why are parents reluctant to have those conversations? Oh, to be honest, it's a difficult conversation. It is a very difficult conversation and everyone's very busy. So how do you start a conversation with a child around being safe online? It's a critical that occurs. And again, I would point you and I'd encourage uh, the listeners to go to the Think You Know website because there's tools there about how to start a conversation. Um, but it's really important that parents start that and they create an environment at home where there is no judgment, there's open conversations and children feel comfortable and safe to speak to their parents around what's happening on, online and what they're seeing online. So once a parent's broken through and had that conversation, what are some of the other things that parents can do to contribute to a safer environment for their child? Once you've had the conversation, I mean, if there is issues of concern, again, I would emphasise going to the Think You Know website because ultimately what we need to do is obviously to look after the child, um, wrap them with all the care they need, 
but also to look at opportunities to identify what's occurred, has an offence been committed, is there something which the police can do? Within the ACE, we have a team, a dedicated team that works seven days a week that assess and triage these referrals so they know what they're looking for. And they're very happy to work with parents and children around what's occurred and to, and to work with them to find out a solution. Again, Stephen, in these situations, parents might be reluctant to go to the authorities because they're escalating and there could be a concern about that. What assurances can you give parents in terms of finding themselves in that situation and then reporting? I, it, it, can be, it can be challenging reporting an issue to the police. I think what I would say is, particularly with online child sexual exploitation, it's important that the child realises that they haven't done anything wrong. Um, they've done nothing wrong because quite often what we have seen is um, for children who are victims of this, it's a feeling of shame um, and they feel reluctant to come to the police. We would encourage you to have that conversation with children and to re-emphasise to children that they've done nothing wrong and that there is a way to work through this. So from a parent's perspective, again, I would encourage them to look at the website, to reach out to the AFP or the Australian Centre to Counter Child Exploitation and we can work with you to, uh, to find a solution which will obviously be in the best interests of the child, but also to ensure that this offending behaviour doesn't continue because if, if it's impacting a child here in Sydney, it's quite likely that the same person may be impacting a child somewhere else in Australia or, or indeed around the world. You've given us some really practical tips there um, and we'll certainly make the link to sure. the website available for all of our parents and carers because what I'm hearing from you is it's less about the technology and more about those behaviours and yep. how to encourage, I suppose, children to feel comfortable to say when they feel uncomfortable. Absolutely, a really important point. I mean, I can only reflect on my my children. I have teenage children and if I was to say that you're no longer online and no longer on your phone, that just wouldn't work. So it is not about banning technology. It can't be, and particularly for older children. It's about having behaviours in the family and also online for kids to understand how to keep themselves online and keep themselves safe a big part of it is recognising, as we know, not everything as it, is as it seems online. Mm. Just because someone purports to be someone doesn't mean they are. Mm. So it's very important for not, yeah, to have those kind of behaviours when the kids are out and about, when they're at school, but also when they're at home. This is how you keep yourself safe online and this is what you need to do. And in circumstances where there is concerns, um, if there is a conversation that, that occurs, encourage the children to, to take a screenshot or something like that so that if we, if it, did end up being something which was possibly a criminal offence, we have some information available that we can can be referred through the ACE and we can use that to kind of start what may be an investigation. And it can help start the conversation as well. 100%, absolutely. Great. Stephen, thanks for sharing your insights on the school report. My pleasure. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Next, we'll be speaking to Yasmin London from YSAFE to understand a bit more about the social networks and platforms our students are using today. For many of us, social media is a big part of our daily lives, and this is increasingly the case for our students and younger people. Now, knowing which social platforms they're using and just how they're using them can sometimes be an overwhelming thing for parents or carers to understand. But to help us unravel the world of social media, we're joined by Yasmin London from YSAFE, one of Australia's leading cyber education organisations. Thanks so much for being with us, Yasmin. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Yasmin, what is it about social media that is so attractive, not just to young people, but to everybody? I think because, you know, love it or hate it, it's really fun. Uh, one of the things that we talk about at YSAFE is that it's actually places that they're going to, not platforms. And that's a really important thing for parents to sort of get their heads around. Because when we think of it in that context, we know that we're going to locations to engage with our friends, to be entertained, to learn new skills. Even when it comes to platforms like TikTok, it's becoming one of the biggest search engines for young people to learn about the, the goings on of the world. So there's lots of different reasons, but typically because it's enjoyable and fun. Can you give us a bit of an outline? I mean, you mentioned TikTok, but a bit of an outline. What are the apps that our children and young people are most being drawn to at the moment? Well, typically there's the top three. So there's TikTok, Instagram and Snapchat. So they all serve a little bit of a different purpose for children and teenagers in different ways. So if we're looking at Snapchat, obviously the disappearing content feature is really fun, but that's really being shaped as a communication platform. So they go on there to talk to their friends, to 
messaging groups. And another feature on it, Snap Maps, is a really interesting one because they can see where their friends are at different right. points in time. If we're looking at Instagram, this is really about uh, an aspirational curation of your life. You're putting your best self out there, uh, the A-grade A reel of, of your life, if you will. Uh, and then TikTok is what uh, they consider an entertainment platform. So they learn about new trends. Uh, they participate in challenges. They do communicate with people from all over the globe, which can be fantastic in terms of community building, but obviously a big risk uh, for young people if they don't know how to keep themselves safe. Yeah. What, what are those risks with TikTok in particular? Look, TikTok is a really interesting platform, but there are a range of risks depending uh, on the age of the child as well. So one of the first things that we share with parents is make sure that your child puts the correct date of birth in when they create an account. So typically in every social media platform, they need to be 13 years and over. But we know that there are kids that are underage on these platforms. Why the date of birth matters so much is because there's pre-formatted safety settings depending right. on the age of the child. So if they're between the ages of 13 and 16, there are default settings like um, they're private by default. They uh, can't have their videos, their videos stitched or duet, duetted or downloaded. So if a predator, for example, came across their, their profile, they wouldn't be able to download that video and share it out. Uh, the algorithm. Can you just explain? <laughs> We're Come both on. quite novice. We Stitched both went stitched and duetted. And duetted. And duetted. Yeah. So this is where a, a portion of a video can be spliced in with somebody else's. So let's okay. say I do a dance challenge and yeah. you wanted to, Tony, copy me because I'm an excellent dancer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you'd, you'd be able to take part of my video, you'd film yourself and then you'd put out a new video of the two of us. So there's ways of taking portions of children's videos right. and, you know, copying them or taking them on for, you know, sinister purposes, I guess. The other really big feature on TikTok that parents need to know about is the For You page. This is where parents can go and actually have a look at the sort of content that their child's been looking at because this For You page is content that is curated for that user based on their viewing history. So if I look at funny cat videos all the time, TikTok's going to read that as, as fun and engaging content and prioritise that for me. So if we're, you know, a parent and we're worried about the sort of things that our children are looking at on, on a platform like TikTok, the For You page will be a really good litmus test to see what they've been viewing because it's likely, you know, what's coming up in that For You page is the same sort of content. And what's particularly important for teenagers and kids as well is understanding how they can hack that algorithm. If there's content that's coming up on their page that they find upsetting or that they don't want to see, one of the really important things to teach them is to block it and report it because that will tell the algorithm to deprioritize more of that content and change it up. Whereas what kids typically do if they see something shocking or uh, something that maybe worries them is they'll often share that with a friend. And what that tells the algorithm is that that was a successful engagement to promote more of that content. So mindfulness around consumption on platforms like TikTok is really important. What about some of the practical tools that parents can use? Are there some of those filtering tools or things that people can look at their child's iPad this afternoon and say, oh, I haven't got that on there or I should have that particular tool checked? Absolutely. So definitely use the tools available in the apps and games that your child uses. So if they're a gamer and they're younger and they play Roblox or Minecraft, for example, there are some good robust safety features in there. So turning those on will be a great start. Um, there's a restricted mode in most of these platforms, which means it will filter content within the app. Uh, TikTok has family pairing, which will allow you to create an account and match that to your child's. And you'll be able to set things like screen time limits. You'll be able to to uh, look at who's messaging them. Uh, Snapchat has really similar features in their, their safety centre. They don't let parents see what the message says, but they can see who's messaging them or they can block adults, for example, connecting with kids. Instagram as well has a range of different features. I think they've got about 30 safety features within that platform that are aimed to help manage a young person's experience. So it might be nudging them to say, you know, you've been on Instagram for a couple of hours, time to take a break. Uh, there's AI that can detect bullying language, for example, that people can, um, can note down within that app and say, I don't want to see that word come through, which is also really important when 
kids sometimes have these passive aggressive ways of bullying each other and they can use words that don't automatically flag Mm. for a parent. When we have the instance that we do tend to think of social media, and this is probably when you're a bit distanced Mm. from it, thinking it's a bit passive, well, my child will just have whatever's sort of served up to them. Where can they go to learn a little bit more about these tools that you're explaining so they make sure that they're doing it? Well, going to the platform and spending some time on it is one of the best things that you can do. Sign up themselves. you, You understand the world, right? So you can speak to the terminology, have a mindset of curiosity, not judgment, so that you can have good open conversations with your children. Um, YSafe provides an online safety hub where parents can go and get current information. I think that's one of the challenges is we do a Google search sometimes and, you know, a blog post from 2019 will pop up and it's not relevant anymore. So it's important to have good current information. But there's also platforms like Common Sense Media in the US, for example, where they do reviews on anything from social media platforms to movies to games to books and it'll be reviewed from the perspective of a young person, a parent and a teacher. So you get that good, well-rounded sort of view on it. And the message being given to teachers and students right now because we hear the bells going off here at Dom Ramey. This is the school report. (laughs) Exactly. This is is real time. (laughs) Yasmin, thanks for these really important insights. They've been very helpful. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Next, we'll be chatting with Michael Dixon from the Sydney Catholic School's student wellbeing team to look at some practical tips parents and carers can put into use at home. We've heard about how to keep our children safe online and have also learnt about the world of social media. Now we want to talk about how we can all promote healthy digital habits in our home life. Joining us is our very own Michael Dixon from the Sydney Catholic School's student wellbeing team. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Jacqueline. It's great to have you here, Michael. We're going to jump straight into it because our focus now is on those practical things. So it's hard for our young people, but all of us really, to put our phones and technology aside, what are some of the really simple ways we can go into that? What can we do to get that balance at home? Yeah, um, I suppose the first thing, the first starting point is um, a reiteration of what the other two, um, Stephen and Jasmine, have both said, is having a conversation early and having a conversation often. And so what those trusting, honest, open conversations can start is they're the beginnings of a tech audit where we get a sense of who is, uh, you know, who are you contacting? When are you contacting? Why are you contacting them? Where are you in the house? All those sort of things. So we want to get information around how technology is being used in the house because that helps to inform a tech agreement. And we can include ourselves in terms of a tech audit. Um, you know, when am, when am I using social media? And when is my son or daughter using social media? And then what we can do is develop uh, an agreement which is differentiated for different people of different age groups in the house. And it allows us to, it allows the young people in the home to have ownership over uh, the rules and regulations, if you like. Um, And I think that provides a framework of safety. And and then checking back in with that and reviewing that, um, I think can go a long way to to allowing young people to embrace technology, um, whilst also being aware of some of the pitfalls of it. Michael, we've been talking about a lot of the dangers and we need to talk about those dangers, be aware of them and we need to act on them as quickly as possible. There's also a huge upside to what's going on at the moment in technology uh, and enormous benefits that can flow. How can we access as much as possible the benefits while looking out for those dangers? Yeah, I think that um, all technology is not created equally. Um, There are certain applications and so on that are highly engaging, highly educational, of benefit to all of us. And yet there and there are other areas of the internet that don't offer um, that same value. So I think a good way for parents to look at this is, is the engagement with technology here, is it active or passive? Four hours spent watching a young person unpacking a present is it would have to be not the best use of someone's time. Whereas if, if someone's using a, a creative app where they could be Um, appreciating or creating art or appreciating or or creating music that's got that's got so much more benefit and if they're on that for an extended period of time I think that's okay Um, I suppose there needs to be balance within that but it's it's about getting to the to the core of what they're doing 
not just, oh, they're on their phone. One of the things that you kind of alluded to when you were speaking then about critical thinking and actually doing work is gaming. And we hear about that more and more. So we've been talking about social media um, and we've been talking about engaging online. But can you talk to us a little bit about gaming in in the life of our young people? We know even some of the educational apps use sort of gamification in terms of teaching reading or maths and things like that. Where is that line between beneficial gaming and when should a parent know that it's getting out of control? Yeah, great question. Um, So there there are gaming apps that help young people with an ADHD diagnosis to manage to manage their impulsivity. So there's definite, um, there's gaming, there's potential for gaming to be a great resource. When it becomes problematic, I think, is when there are big moments about, around the removal of gaming. So if, young, if a young person becomes very emotional when we say that gaming stop, that's an indicator that things aren't where they should be. People that are getting up in the morning and gaming straight away is a concern. People that are... Um, having social conflicts with people that they might have had, you know, a gaming incident with the night before. That, they're all these little indicators that, that there may be something that's gone awry there um, with the gaming. But there are also elements of gaming like collaboration, um, like team building, that, that I think done in the right way can be enhanced. We know that uh, a child's peers are really important in terms of what they want to do and who they want to be. But, of course, parents are really important in terms of role models as well. (laughs) So what can parents do in terms of this area of of the digital world in terms of being role models and being conscious that their behaviour is, in fact, very influential as well? Yeah. um, I think we've all seen situations where technology is used as a pacifier for young people. Um, And we've all seen situations where parents aren't present because they're engaged in their own technology. I think being able to, first of all, parents being able to recognise the importance of the role modelling um, and then buying into the agreement. If we're fair dinkum about the agreement, we all have to to buy into it. It's, It's... Contractual is probably too strong a word, but, it, you know, we want everybody to, to, fit, to meet these terms. And similarly, what's, what happens when we don't meet them? So, you know, mum or dad that are on their phone at the dinner table, if that's part of the agreement, what's, the, what's if you like, the consequence for that? Um, I think that helps parents to recognise the critical role they, they play in, in just making sure that it's used with balance. There's just one thing that maybe parents can take away from this is if every night, if it's possible to sit around that dinner table with no technology and just our thoughts and ideas and conversation, that's a really good thing to start with, isn't it? Yeah, that would be a great starting point because even turning off the TV, you know, sometimes the TV's there in the background, you can hear it, turning that off. It's, young people are so adaptable. They, they, you know, it's, I think it's, it's okay to be bored. We can get you know, we can get comfortable with boredom. Boredom's a, 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 kids are so adaptable, they will re- respond really, really quickly to it. And those conversations will be so much more um, engaging and deep and honest. And you're going to learn so much more about each other because we haven't got these at, at that time is a, is a distraction. Another aspect that, that I might just touch on is what's called a digital fast. And that's where um, families can agree that they're going to park um, all media for let's say a month, that's quite, it, it might, obviously that work, quite yeah, challenge. it will be tricky. Um, work related is okay. But in terms of, in terms of um, technology for entertainment's sake, very, very quickly, all of those um, other forms of entertainment come to light. Um, you know, people are out in nature, people are appreciating or making music and art. And just, as you said, Tony, just the, you know, the art of conversation. Thank you. That's really important. We thank you so much, Michael, and also to Stephen and Yasmin for joining us today. To those watching at home, we hope our guests have helped you to better understand just how our students are interacting with their online world and what parents can do to support their children as they navigate all things technology and social media. At Sydney Catholic Schools, we want to ensure that our students feel safe and comfortable when dealing with technology, but also empowered by the possibilities, opportunities and innovation it can present. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of The School Report. We look forward to seeing you soon.